A man has a dream, and he pursues that dream, but time waits for no one. Far Centaurus by A. E. Van Vogt, read by Carl Wallace. I wakened with a start and thought, how is Renfrew taking it? I must have moved physically, for blackness edged with pain closed over me. How long I lay in that agonized fate, I have no means of knowing. The new awareness was the stressing of the engines that drove the spaceship. Slowly this time, consciousness returned. I lay very quiet, feeling the weight of my years of sleep, determined to follow the routine prescribed, prescribed so long ago by Pullman. I didn't want to fade again. I lay there and thought, it was silly to have worried about Jim Renfrew. It wasn't due to come out of his denomination for another 50 years. I began to watch the illuminated face of the clock in the ceiling. It had registered 2312. Now it was 2322. The ten minutes Hellman had suggested for a time lapse between passivity and initial action were up. Slowly, I pushed my head toward the end, end of the bench. Click. My fingers pressed the button that was there. There was a faint hum. The automatic massager began to fumble gently over my naked form. First I rubbed my arms, then it moved my legs, and so on over my body. As I progressed, I could feel the fine slick of oil and oozement working into my dry skin. A dozen times I could have screamed from the pain of life returning, but an hour I was able to sit up and turn on the lights. The small, sparsely furnished familiar room couldn't hold my attention for more than an instant. The nausea passed. It required effort of will for me to walk to the door, open it, and head along the narrow corridor that led to the control panel. I wasn't supposed to so much as pause there, but a spasm of absolutely fearful fascination seized me. I couldn't help it. I leaned over the control chair and glanced at the chronometer. It said 53 years, 7 months, 2 weeks, 0 days, 0 hours, 27 minutes. 53 years. A little blindly, almost blankly, I thought. Back on Earth, the people we'd known, young men we'd gone to college with. The girl who kissed me at the party gave us the night we left. They were all dead, or dying of old age. I remember the girl very vividly. She was pretty, vivacious. A complete stranger. She laughed as she offered me her red lips and she said, A kiss for the ugly one, too. She's your grandmother now, or in her grave. Tears came to my eyes. I brushed them away and began to heat the can of concentrated liquid that was to be my first food. Slowly my mind calmed. Fifty three years and seven and one half months, I thought drably. Nearly four years over my allotted time. I had to do some figuring before I took another dose of eternity drug. Twenty grains had been calculated to preserve my flesh and my life for exactly fifty years. The stuff was evidently more potent than Helen had been able to estimate from his short period of advanced tests. I sat tense, narrow eyed, thinking about it. Abruptly, I grew conscious of what I was doing. Laughter spat from my lips. The sound split the silence like a series of pistol shots startling me. But it also relieved me. Was I seeing her actually being critical? This is only four years with a bullseye across that span of years. Why, well, I was alive and still young. Time and space had been conquered. The universe belonged to man. I ate my soup, sipping each spoonful deliberately. I made the bowl last every second of thirty minutes. Then, greatly refreshed, I made my way back to the control room. This time I paused for a long walk through the plates. It took only a few moments to locate Saul a very brightly glowing star on the approximate center of the rear view plate. I was entirely required longer to locate, but it shone finally, a glow, glow point in the light sprinkled darkness. I wasted no time trying to estimate their distances. They looked right. Fifty-four years we had covered approximately one-tenth of the form one-third light years to the famous nearest star system. Satisfied, I started on my way back to the living quarters. Take them a row, I thought. Pelham first. As I opened the airtight door of Pelham's room, a sickening odor of decayed flesh tingled on my nostrils. With a gasp, I slammed the door, stood there in the narrow hallway, shuddering. After a moment, there was still nothing but the reality. Pelham was dead. I can't currently remember what I did then. I ran. I knew that. I flung open and ran through his door, then Blake's. The queen, sweet smell of their rooms, the sight of their silent bodies in their beds, brought back a measure of my sanity. A great sadness came to me. Poor brave Pelham. 
Inventor of the eternity drug that made the great plunge in interstellar space possible. Look like dead now from his own invention. What was it you'd said? The chances are greatly against any of us dying. The dose I'm calling a death factor of about 10%. A byproduct of the first dose. If our bodies survive the initial shock, they will survive uh, additional doses. The death factor must be greater than 10%. An extra four years that drug kept me asleep. Gloomy, I went to the store room and procured my personal spacesuit and a tarpaulin. But even with their help, it was a horrible business. At last, they cursed the tarpaulin and contest to the airlock and shoved it into space. I felt pressed now for time. These waking periods were to be brief appears, and what we call the current oxygen was to be used up, but the main reserves were not to be touched. Chemicals in each room slowly refreshed the current air over the years, running up to the next to awaken. In some curious defensive fashion, we had neglected to allow for emergencies such as the death of one of our members. Even as I climbed on the spacesuit, I could feel the difference in the air I was breathing. I went first to the radio. We calculated half a light year was the limit of radio perception, and we were approaching that limit now. Hurriedly, though carefully, I wrote the report out. The radio and transcription record is turned sending. I set the report to repeat a hundred times. In a little more than five months hence, headlines will be flaring on Earth. I clamped my wit written report into the ship logbook and added a note from Murphy with the bottom. It was a brief tribute to, to Pelham. Bright praise was heartfelt, but there was another reason behind my note. They had been pals. Renfu, the engineering genius who built the ship, and Pelham, the great chemist doctor, was a strange drug who made it possible for men to take this fantastic journey into vastness. It seemed to me that Renfu, walking up in the great silence of the hurling ship, would be my tribute to his friend and colleague. It was little enough for me to do, I love them both. For the note written, I hastily examined the glowing engines, made notations of several instrument readings, and then counted out 55 grains of, of the eternity drug. That was as close as I could get to the amount I felt would be required for 150 years. For a long moment before sleep came, I thought of Renfu, and the horrible shock was coming to him. I top of all the natural reaction to his situation that would strike deep in his peculiar sensitive nature. I stirred uneasily at the picture. The worry was still in my mind when darkness came. Almost instantly I opened my eyes, I was thinking, the drug, it hadn't worked. The draggy feel of my body warned me of the truth. I lay very still watching the clock overhead. This time it was easier to f f follow the routine, except that, once more, I could not refrain from examining the chronometer as I passed through the galley. It read 201 years, 1 month, 3 weeks, 5 days, 7 hours, 8 minutes. I sipped my bowl of that soup, and then went eagerly to the big logbook. It's not only really possible for me to describe the thrill that coursed through me, as I saw this familiar handwriting of Blake, and then as I turned back the pages of Renfrew. My excitement drained slowly as I read what Renfrew had written. It was a report, nothing more. The gravimetric readings, careful calculation of the distance covered, detailed report of the performance of the engines, finally an estimate of our speed variations based on the seven consistent factors. It was a splendid mathematical job. First-rate scientific analysis, but that was all there was. No mention of Pelham, not a word or comment on what I had written or what had happened. Renford had wakened, and if his report was only criterion, he might as well have been a robot. I knew better than that. So, as I saw, as I began to read Blake's report, to Blake, Bill, tell us sheet out when you read it. Well, the worst has happened. We couldn't have asked fate to give us an un kind of your kick in the pants. Hate to think of Pelham being dead. What a man he was. What a friend. But we all know the risk we were taking. He more than any of us. So all we can say is, sleep well, good friend. We'll never for forget you. The rent through his case is now serious. After all, we were worried, wondering how he'd take his first awakening, went along with a bang between the eyes like Pelham's death. And I think the first anxiety was justified. As you and I have always known, Renfrew was one of Earth's fair-haired boys. Just imagine any one human being born with his combination of looks, money, and intelligence. His greatest fault was that he never let the future, future trouble him. With a dazzling personality of his, and a crew of worshipping women and yes-men around him, he didn't have much time for anything but the present. Reality is always struck him like a thunderbolt. He could leave those three ex-wives of his, 
and they weren't so X if you ask me, but our grasping that was forever. My goodbye, par goodbye party was enough to put anyone into a state of mental haze when it came to realities. To wake up and hundred years later, realize that those he loved had withered, died, and beaten by worms? Well, I deliberately pulled as boldly of that. The human mind stinks of awfully strange ankles, no matter how it censors speech. I personally counted on Pelham acting as a sort of psychological support to Renfrew. Both know that Pelham recognized the extent of his influence over Renfrew. That influence must be replaced. Try to think of something, Bill, when you're charging around doing the routine work. We've got to live with that guy if you'll wake up at the end of 500 years. Tear up this sheet. What follows his routine? Ned. I burned the letter in the incinerator, examined the two sleeping bodies. How deadly quiet they lay. And then returned to the control room. In the plate, the sun was a very bright, bright star, a jewel set in black velvet, a gorgeous, shining brilliant. Alpha Centauri was brighter. It was a radiant, radiant light in that a, a panoply of black and glitter. It was still impossible to make up the separate suns of Alpha, A, B, and C in Proxima, but the combined light brought a sense of awe and majesty. Excitement blazed inside me. Consciousness came with the glory of the ship we were making. The first men to head to Far Centaurus, the first man to dare aspire to the stars. Even a thought of Earth failed to dim that surging tide of wonder. I thought that seven, possibly eight generations, had been born since our departure. The thought that the girl who had given me that sweet remembrance of her red lips was now known to her sentence as their great 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 grandmother, if she was remembered at all. The immense time involved, the whole idea, was too meaningless for emotion. I did my work. I took my throat dose to the drug and went to sleep. The sleep found me still without a plan about Renfrew. When I woke up, alarm bells were ringing. I lay still. There was nothing else to do. It was mental torture even to think of it, I realized. No matter what the danger, the quickest way was to follow my routine to the second and in every detail. Somehow I did it. The bells changed and burred, but I lay there until it was time to get up. The clamor was hideous as I passed through the control room. But I passed, and sat for half an hour sipping my soup. The conviction came to me, if that sound continued much longer, Blake and Renfrew would surely wake from their sleep. At last I felt free to cope with the emergency. Breathing hard, I eased myself into the control chair, cut off the mind of alarms, and switched on the plates. A fire glowed at me from the rearview plate. It was a colossal white fire, larger than it was wide, and filled nearly a quarter of the whole sky. A hideous thought came to me, I must be within a few meter miles of some monstrous sun that had recently roared in this part of space. Frantically, I manipulated the distance estimators, then for a moment stared in blank disbelief for the answers that clicked mecha metallically onto the product plate. Seven miles. Only seven miles. Curious is the human mind. A moment before, when I had thought of it as an abnormally shaped sun, it hadn't resembled anything but an incandescent mass. Or broke me now, I saw it had a solid outline, an unmistakable material shape. Sun, stunned, I leaped to my feet because it was a spaceship, an enormous mile long ship. Rather, I sank back into my seat, subdued by the catastrophe I was witnessing, and consciously adjusting my mind, the flaming hell of what had been a spaceship. Nothing that had been alive could possibly still be conscious of that horror of ravenous fire. The only possibility was that the crew had succeeded in launching lifeboats. Like a madman, I searched heavens for a light, a good to metal that would show the presence of survivors. There was nothing but the night and the stars and the hell of the burning ship. After a long time, I noticed it was further away and seemed to be receding. Whatever drive forces matched its velocity to ours must be yielding to the fury of the energy, energies that were consuming the ship. I began to take pictures, and I felt justified in turning on the oxygen reserves. As we drew into distance, the miniature Nova that had been a torpedo-shaped space liner began to change color to lose its white intensity. My last glimpse showed this long, dull glow to it, nothing else than a cherry-covered nebula seen edge on. It had already, in between observations, done everything required to me. Now I reconnected the arm system and, very, very reluctantly, my mind seething with speculation, returned to bed. As I waited for my final dose of the trip to take effect, I thought, the great star system of Alpha Centauri must have inhabited planets. If we, my calculations were correct, we were only 1.6 light years from the main Alpha group of suns. 
slightly nearer than that to red the Proxima group. Here it was proof the universe had at least one other supremely intelligent race. Wonders beyond what wild expectations were in store for us. Thrill and thrill of anticipation raced through me. As it was only that last instant, as sleep was already grasping at my brain, that the realization struck I had completely forgotten about the problem of Renfrew. I felt an alarm. Surely even Renfrew would come alive in the great fashion of his when confronted with a complex alien civilization. But trouble's all over. Excitement must have bridged that final 150 years of time, because when I awakened I thought, We're here. It's over. The long night. The incredible journey. We'll all be waking, seeing each other, as well as the civilization out there. Seeing, too, the great Centauri suns. The same string, it struck me as I lay there exulting, but the time seemed long. And yet, yet I've been awake only three times, and only once for the equivalent of a full day. In a true sense of meaning, I had seen Blake and Renfrew and Pelham not more than a day and a half ago. I had only 36 hours of consciousness since a pair of soft lips had set something against mine and clung in the sweetest kiss of my life. Then why was feeling that millennia had ticked by, second on slow second? Why this eerie empty awareness of a journey through fathomless and unending night? Was the human mind so easily fooled? It seemed to me, finally, that the answer was that I had been alive for almost 500 years, almost cells and organs had existed, not even possible that some part of my brain had been horrendously aware throughout the entire unthinkable period. And then there was, of course, the additional psychological fact that I now knew that 500 years had gone by and that I saw with a mental start that my 10 minutes were up. Cautiously, I turned on the, the, the massager. The gentle padded hands had been working on me for about 15 minutes when my door opened. The light clicked on and there stood Blake. After a minute, I was able to look at him without seeing words. I saw that he was carrying a bowl of the soup. He stood staring down at me with a strangely grim expression on his face. At last, his long, thin countenance relaxed into a wan grin. No, Bill, he said. Shh, he hissed immediately. Now don't try to speak. I'm going to start feeding in this soup while you're still laying down. The sooner you're up, the better I'll, I'll like it. He was grim again as he finished, almost as if it were an afterthought. I went up for two weeks. He sat down on the edge of the bed and laid out a spoonful of soup. There was silence then, except for the rustling sound of the massager. Slowly the strength flowed through my body, and with each passing second I became more aware of the grimness of Blake. What about Renfrew? I managed finally, hoarsely. He awake? Blake hesitated and nodded. His expression darkened with a frown. He said simply, He's mad, Bill. Stark, staring mad. I had to tie him up. Got him, they got him now in his room. He's quieter now, but at the beginning he was a gibbering maniac. Are you crazy? He whispered at that. Renfrew was never so sensitive as that. Depressed and sick, yet, yeah, but the mere passage of time of what Dr. Warren said all his friends were dead couldn't make him insane. Bill was shaking his head. It isn't only that. Bill, he paused and, Bill, I want you to prepare your mind for the greatest shock it's ever had. I stared up at him with an empty feeling inside me. What do you mean? He went on grimacing. I know you'd be able to take it, so don't get scared. You and I, Bill, just a couple of lugs. We're long because we went to university with Renfrew and Pelham. Basically, it wouldn't matter to a census if I guess whether we landed in 1 million BC or AD. We just look around and say, Fancy seeing you here, or who was that pterodactyl I saw you with last night? That was no pterodactyl, that was, uh, Una Thurston's bulbous brained wife. I whispered, Get to the point, Bill, what's up? Blake wrote to his feet. After I read the reports about and seen the photographs of that burning ship, I got an idea. The Alpha Suns were pretty close two weeks ago, only about six months away at our average speed of 500 miles a second. I thought to myself, we'll see if I can tune in some of their radio stations. Well, we smiled, Riley. I get hundreds in a few minutes. They came in all over the seven dial waves with bell-like clarity. He paused and stared down at me, and his smile was a sickly thing. Bill, he groaned, with a prize fools in creation. When I told Renfrew the truth, he folded up like ice melting in the water. Once more he paused. The silence was too much for my straining nerves. For heaven's sakes, man, I began, and stopped, and lay there very still. Just like that, the lightning of understanding flashed on me. My blood seemed to thunder to my veins. The last week, I said, you mean? Blake nodded. Yeah, he said, that's the way it is. 
They already spotted us with our spy rays and energy streams. Chip's coming out to meet us. And we hope you finish gloomy. They can do something for Jim. I was sitting in the control chair an hour later when I saw the queens in the darkness. It was a flash of bright silver that exploded in his eyes. Next distance, an enormous spaceship had master velocity less than a mile away. Blake and I looked at each other. Did they say, I said shakily, that ship left his hangar ten minutes ago? Blake nodded. They could make their ship from Alps to Earth Centauri in three hours, he said. Hadn't heard that before. Something happened inside my brain. What? I shouted. Why is it taking us 500? I stopped. I sat there. Three hours, he whispered. How could we have forgotten human progress? In the silence that fell in, we watched a dark hole open the cliff-like wall that faced us. Into this cavern, I directed our ship. The rear view plate showed that the cave entrance was closing. Head of us, lights flashed on and focused on a door. As I eased our craft to the middle floor, a face flickered on, onto our uh, faceplate. How's a hot it? Blake pushed my ear. The only chap to, to talk directly so far. It was a distinguished, scurry looking head and face that peered at us. He smiled and said, You may leave your ship and go through the door you see. I had a sense of empty spaces around us as we climbed generally out to the vast reception chamber. Interplanetary spaceship hangars are like that, I reminded myself. Only this one had an alien quality of the nerves, I thought sharply. But I could see that Blake felt it too. A silent duo, we filed through the doorway into a hallway that opened into a very large, luxurious room. But such a room as a king or a movie actress on set might have walked into without blinking. It was all hung with glor glorious tapestries. And as for what I thought they were tapestries, I saw they weren't. They were. I couldn't decide. I'd seen expensive furniture in some of the apartments the rent room maintained. But these settees, chairs, and tables glittered at us. They were made of a matching design of differently colored fires. That was wrong. They didn't glitter at all. They. Once more, I couldn't decide. I had no time for more uh, detailed examination. For a man, arrayed very much as we were, was rising from one of the chairs. He came forward smiling. Then he slowed, his, his nose wrinkling. A moment later, he hastily shook her hands and retreated to a chair ten feet away and sat down rather primly. It was a stoutly ungracious performance, but I was glad that he had drawn back that way. Because, he shook my hands so briefly, I had caught a faint whiff of perfume from him. It was a vaguely unpleasant odor, and besides, a man using perfume in quantities? He was motioning us to sit down, just so wondering, was this our, our reception? The erstwhile radio operator began, about your friend, I must caution you. He's a schizoid type, and our psychologist will be able to effect a temporary recovery only for the moment. A permanent cure will require a longer period, and your fullest cooperation. Following readily with all of Mr. Redfield's plans, unless of course he takes a dangerous turn. But for now, he grants us a smile, permit me to welcome you to the four planets of Centauri. It's a great moment for me personally. For early childhood, I've been trained for the sole purpose of being your mentor and guide. Naturally, I'm overjoyed by time has come when exhausted studies of the middle period in English language and custom can be put to the practical use for which they were intended. He didn't look overjoyed. It was Rickway's nose in that funny way he'd already noticed, and there was a generally pained expression on his voice. It was his words that had shocked me. What do you mean, I asked, studies in American. Don't people speak the universal language anymore? Of course, he smiled. But the language has developed to a point where, I might as well be frank, would have difficulty understanding me. He sat silent. Blake chewed his lower lip. As Blake just finally said, What kind of place is on Centauri planet? Is there something on the radio about the population centers having reverted to the city structure again? I shall be happy, he said, to show as many of our great cities as you care to see. You are a guest, and several main credits have been placed to your separate accounts for you to use as you see fit. I must, however, he went on, give, give you a warning. Important you to don't disillusion our people about themselves. Therefore, you must never wander around the streets or mingle with the crowds in any way. Always, your contact should be via newsreels, radio, or from the inside of a closed machine. If you have any plan to marry, you must now finally give up the idea. I don't get it, Blake said wondering. He spoke for both of us. He finished firmly. It's important that no one became aware that you have an offensive physical odor. It might damage your financial prospects uh, considerably. And now, he stood up, for the time being, I shall leave you. I hope you don't mind if I wear a mask in the future in your presence. I wish you well, gentlemen, and... 
He pushed Blanche past us and said, Ah, here's your friend. I whirled and I could see Blake twisting, staring. Hi there, fellows. Rufus said cheerfully from the door. Then Riley, have we ever been a bunch of suckers? I felt choked. He wrist up to him, caught his hand, hugged him. Blake was trying to do the same. We finally released Renfrew and looked around. Our host was gone. Which is just as well. I've been wanting to punch him in the nose for his final uh, remarks. Well, here goes, Renfrew said. He looked at Blake and me, grinned, rubbed his hands together gleefully and asked, For a week I've been watching, he have questions to ask this, Clark, and he faced our host. What he began makes the speed of white constant. He didn't even blink. Velocity equals the cube of the uh, cube root of GD, he said. G being the depth of the space continuum, G the total tolerance of gravity, or as you would say, of all the matter in that uh, continuum. How are planets formed? A sun that bounces itself in the space that it in. It throws that matter as the sea vessel does anchors. That's a very rough description. I could give it to you in a mathematical formula, but I have to write it down. After all, I'm not a scientist. Just a minute, the riff puzzled us. Sun throws this matter out without any pressure other than its desire to balance itself? Our host stared at him. Of course not. The reason the pressure involved is very potent, I assure you. Without such a balance, the sun was fall out of the space. Only a few bachelor suns have learned how to maintain stability without planets. A few what? echoed uh, Renfrew. I can see if he jarred and began the question he began to ask, by, ask one by Swift One. Our host's words cut across my thought. He said, A bachelor sun is a very old, cooled Class M star. That's what's known as a temperature of 190 degrees F, the coldest 48. Literally, a bachelor is a rogue, short of human age. Its main feature is that it permits no matter, no planets, let alone not even gases in its vicinity. Renfrew sat silent, frowning, thoughtful. I seized the opportunity to carry out a train of ideas. This business, I said, of knowing all this stuff without being a scientist interests me. For instance, back home, every kid understood the atomic rocket principle practically from the day he was born. Boys of eight and ten wrote in especially made toys, took them apart and put them together again. They thought atomic rocket and any new develops in the field was just pipe for them to absorb. This is what I'd like to know. What is the parallel here to that particular angle? The Ala de Nectar Force, said our host. I've already tried to explain it to Mr. Renfrew, but his mind seemed to blank out the most simple aspects. Renfrew roused himself, grimaced. He's been trying to tell me that electrons think, and I won't swallow it. Our host shook his head. Not think, they don't think, but they have a psychology. Electronic psychology, I added. Simply. Any child. Renfrew groaned. I know. Any child of six could tell me. He turned to us. That's why I wind up a lot of questions. I figured if we got a good intermediate grounding, we could slip into this bigger stuff the way our kids do. Fisher host. Next question. What? He broke his watch. I'm afraid, Mr. Renfrew, that if you and I are going to be on the ferry to the Pelham planet, we better leave now. We can ask your questions on the way. What's all this? I chimed in. Renfrew exclaimed. He's taking me to the great engineering laboratories in the European mountains of Pelham. Want to come along? Not me, I said. Blake shrugged. I don't fancy getting any of those suits he's provided for us. He's either keep our order in, but not theirs out. He finished. Bill and I will stay here and play poker for some of that five million credits worth of dough we've got at the state bank. Our host stood at the door. There was a distinct frown on the flush mask he wore. You shoot our government drift very lightly. Yeah, said Blake. So we stink, said Blake. It was nine days since our host had taken room fruit to the Planet Pelham. Our only contact had been a radio telephone from him on the third day, telling us not to worry. Wait was standing at the window of our penthouse apartment in the city of Numerica, and I was on my back on a couch. My mind, a mixture of thoughts involving Renfrew's potential insanity, all the things I'd heard and seen about the history of the past 500 years. I roused myself. Great, it, I said. We're faced with the change of metabolism of the human body. Probably do it in many different foods and most stars that they eat. Might be able to smell better too, but just being nearest his agony to our host, whereas the only noise and unpleasantness from him. Excuse the three of us against beings of them. Frankly, I don't see an early victory over the problem, so let's just take it quietly. It was no answer, so I returned to my uh, reverie. My first version of the message had been, or had been picked up. 
And so, when the interstellar drive was invented in 2320 AD, less than 104 years after our departure, it was realized that would eventually happen. In our honor, the four habitable planets of the Alpha, A, and B suns were called Renfrew, Pelham, Blake, and Endicott. Since 2320, the population of the four planets has become so dense that a total of 19 billion people now dwell on their nearly line spaces. This is spider migrations to the planets of the more distant stars. The space liner I'd seen burning in 2511 AD was the only ship ever lost on the, on the Earth's uh, uh, Centauri line. Traveling at full speed, its screens must have reacted against their spaceship. All the ammonic, all the ammonics were probably flashed on, and as those defenses were not able to time to shop a ship that had gone minus infinity, every recall engine above aboard had probably blown up. Such a thing could not uh, 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 happen again. We've been told not to feel any sense of blame for that one disaster, as many of the most important advances in that field have been made as a result of theoretical analysis of that great catastrophe. I grew aware that Blake had flung himself disgustingly into a nearby chair. Boy, oh boy, he said, this is going to be some life for us. We can all anticipate about 50 more years of being pariahs in civilization we can't even begin to understand, understand how the simplest machines works. I stared easily. I had similar thoughts. I said nothing. Blake w went on. I must admit, after I first discovered the entire plants of my colonists, I pictured myself bowling over some dame and marrying her. Involuntarily, my mind leaped to the memory of a pair of lips lifting up to mine. I shook myself and said, I wonder how Renfrew was taking all of this. He, a familiar voice from the door cut off my words. Renfrew, he said, is taking things beautifully now. The first shock is the unit of resignation, resignation to purpose. We turned to face him by the time he finished. Renfrew walked slowly towards us, grinning. Watching him, I felt uncertain as to take how to take his built up sanity. He was at his best. His dark, wavy hair was perfectly calm. His sternly blue eyes made his whole face come alive. It was a natural physical wonder, the normal height he had all the shine and swagger of an actor in a carefully tailored film. He wore that shine and swagger now. He said, I bought a spaceship, fellows. Took all my money and part of yours, too. But I knew you'd back me up. Am I right? Why, sure, why can I echo? Blake went on alone. What's the idea? I get it, I chimed. We'll cruise all the universe. Never I spent exploring new worlds. Jim, you've got some something there. Blake and I were just going to enter a, a, a suicide pact. Reverend was smiling. We'll cruise for a while, anyway. Two days later, our host offered no objection and no advice about Renfrew. We were in space. It was a curious three months that followed. For a while, I felt a sense of awe at the vastness of the cosmos. Silent planets swung into our viewing plates and faded remote just behind us, giving a nostalgic memory of uninhabited, wind lashed forests and plains, deserted, swollen seas and nameless suns. The sight and remembrance brought loneliness like an ache and a knowledge, the slow knowledge that this journeying was not lifting the weight of strangeness that had settled upon us since our arrival at Alpha Centauri. There was nothing here for our souls to feed on, nothing that would satisfactorily fill one year of our life, let alone fifty. I watched the realization grow on Blake, and I waited for a sign from Renfrew that he felt it too. The sign didn't come. That of itself worried me, but I grew aware of something else. Renfrew was watching us. Watching us with a hint in his manner of secret knowledge, the suggestion of secret purpose. My alarm grew, and Renfrew's perpetual cheerfulness didn't help any. I was laying on my bunk on the end of the third month, thinking uneasily about the whole unsatisfied solution my door opened and Renfrew came in. He carried a, a paralyzing gun on the rope, pointed the gun at me and said, Sorry, Bill. He told me to take no chances, so let's lay quiet while I tie you up. Blake, I bellowed. Renfro shook his head gently. No use, he said. I was in his room first. The gun was steady in his fingers. His blue eyes were steely. All I could do was test my muscles against the rope as he tried them and trust the fact that I was twice as strong, at least, as he was. I thought this way. Sorry I could run from, 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 from tying me too tightly. He stepped back, finally said again, Sorry, Bill, he added. Hate to tell you this, but once you went off the deep end mentally with Dr. Centauri, this is the cure prescribed by the psychologist to our host consulted. I was supposed to get a shock as big as the one that knocked, knocked you for a loop. The first time I paid no attention to his mentioning of our host's name, and my mind played with understanding. Incredibly, Renfrew had been told that Blake and I were mad. 
All this must be held steady by a sense of responsibility towards us. It was a beautiful psychological scheme. The only thing was, what shock was going to be administered? Renfrew's voice cut off my thought. He thought, it won't be long now. We're already entering the field of the bachelor son. Bachelor son, I yelled. He made a reply. The instant the door closed behind him, I began to work on my bonds all this time thinking, what was it he'd said? Bachelor sons maintained this space by a precarious balancing. In this space, the sweat tore down my face as I picked myself being precipitated into another plane of the space time continuum. I could feel the ship falling when I finally worked my hands free of the rope. I hadn't been tied long enough for the course to interfere with my circulation. I headed for Blake's room. Two minutes we were on the way to the control room. Lefford didn't see us till we had him. Blake grabbed his gun, held him out of the control chair with mine money he would dump him onto the floor. We lay there unresisting, grinning up at us. Too late, he said. We're forcing the first point of intelligence. There's nothing you can do except prepare for the shock. I scarcely heard him. I put myself into the chair and glanced through the drain plates. Nothing showed. I stood for a second. Then I saw the recorded instruments. They were trembling furiously, were registering a body of infinite size. For a long moment, I stared crazily at those incredible figures. Then I plunged the decelerator far over. For that pressure of the f fully driven drive, the machine grew rigid. I had a sudden fantastic picture of two irresistible forces in full collision. Gasping, I drug the power out of gear. We were still falling. An orbit, like we say, get us in an orbit. Shaking fingers, I kind of went out on the keyboard. Basing my fingers on a sun of solar size, gravity, and mass. The bachelor wouldn't let us have it. Try the orbit, and a third, and more. Finding one that would give us an orbit around money and Antares itself, but the deadly reality remained. The ship plunged on, down and down. There was nothing visible on the plates, not a real shadow of substance. It seemed to be once I could make out a vague blur of greater darkness against the black faces of space. But the stars were few in every direction, it was impossible to be sure. Finally, in despair, I wore the seat and that was San Renfrew was still making the offer to get up. Listen, Jim, I pleaded, what did you do this for? What's going to happen? He was smiling easily. I think, he said, of an old, crusty human bachelor. He maintains relationship with his fellows. The association is remote as that which is used between a bachelor son and the stars of the galaxy of which it is part. He added, any second now we'll strike the first period of uh, in intolerance. It works in jumps, though, like quanta. Each period being 498 years, 7 months, and 8 days, plus a few hours. It sounded like gibberish. What's going to happen, I urged? For God's sake, man. I looked at me blindly and then smiled at him. I had the sudden wondering realization that he was sane. The old completely Jim Riffrew made better somehow, stronger. He said quietly, Well, I'll just knock it out of its toleration error, and doing so will put us back. Bam! The words was immensely violent. With a bang, I struck the floor, skidded, and then a hand, Renfrew's, caught me, and it was all over. I stood up, conscious that we were no longer falling. I looked at the instrument board. All the lights were dim, untribbled, the needles firmly at zero. I turned his stare at Renfrew and at Blake, who was ruefully picking him up himself up on the floor. Renfrew said, Maybe on the control board, though, I want to set our course for Earth. For a long moment, I gazed at them, and then slowly I stepped aside. I stood by to set the controls and pulled the accelerator over. Renfrew looked up. Reach us in about eight hours, I said. It had been about a year and a half after we left 500 years ago. Something began to tug at the roof of my cranium. It took several seconds before I decided it was probably my brain dripping with a tremendous understanding that suddenly flowed in on me. The batch for sun, I thought decently. Easing aside of its field of towers, it simply precipitated us into a period of time beyond its field. Renfrew had said, Instead of working jumps of 498 years and some seven months, and what about the ship? Wouldn't 27th century technology brought to the 22nd century before it was invented change the course of history? I mumbled the question. Renfro shook his head. Do we understand it? Do we even dare monkey with the raw power inside those engines? We'll say not. As a ship, what for our own private use? But, but I began. He shut me off. Look, Bill, he said, here's the situation. That girl I kissed you? Don't think I didn't see you falling like a ton of bricks. Gonna be sitting beside you 50 years from now. When your voice from space was first to Earth, you awakened on your first lap with the first trip to Alpha Centauri. That's exactly what happened. The End <laughs>